Good morning, good morning, good morning, and Merry Christmas to you. Those of you that celebrated on yesterday, Christmas Day, Saturday morning, we praise God for this uh, celebration, our opportunity to celebrate Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast today. I am delighted to be with you on this Sunday morning. You know, I praise God for the number of Sundays, 52 in a year, that I've been able to be with you. And this morning, I'm coming from the studio. And so we not having, we're not having physical service, as you can see, and I am grateful that I've been able to preach all of this year and that we are now getting ready to eulogize 2021. Praise the Lord. This is the last Sunday. We have a few more days before the year end, and then we're going to bring into 2022. Praise God. But I thank God for your tuning in. I want to introduce Dr. Anderson is coming with a exhortation and explaining to you the birth of Jesus Christ and the importance of you being born again. So let's receive Dr. Anderson as she share with us the first half of our broadcast and then I will be coming back with you to share in the second half. God bless you and thank you so much for being with us. God for bringing us down to the final Sunday of 2021. God is a faithful God. He is an awesome God and he continuously watches over his word to perform it. Well, I'm excited to be with you on today as we um, celebrate the Christmas season, the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so the Lord dropped in my spirit that we should uh, take a look at the new birth. We're looking at Christ's birth. And so we want to look at the birth of a Christian. And so again, we're going to make a comparison today to do a direct parallel, comparing the conception of Jesus Christ um, to that of being born again. And so to begin our study, we're going to take a look over in the book of John uh, chapter three. And here Jesus is having a conversation with Nic Nicodemus. And so if you're reading along with me, John chapter three, and we're going to read verses one through seven. And it reads like this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So as we take a look at this, we see that Nicodemus has been apparently um, listening to the word of God, listening to Jesus's preachings, and he's coming to him in secret, coming to him um, at night, um, just acknowledging the fact that you are a teacher. You have to be sent from God because no one can do what you do except God be with him. So the conversation continues in verse three. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here you can see that Jesus is introducing to Nicodemus the thought process of being born again, the new birth, that which each of us as believers must go through. Verse four, Nicodemus is a little bit confused. So he says to him, how can a man be born when he is old? And the same question that Nicodemus has, many of us may have had as we've sat in church and we've listened to the word of God being taught and we've heard Christians say, you must be born again. Um, in our mind, we're saying, how is this possible? Because in our mind, we have one conception of what birth is like. He asked another question. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And so again, Nicodemus is saying, this is impossible. Once I'm old, once I'm an adult, even as a child, you can't go back into your mother's womb and be born a, a second time. So Jesus begins to explain to him, 
Verse number five, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So Jesus is clarifying to Nicodemus here that he's talk, not talking about a natural occurrence. Uh, the natural occurrence of a husband and wife coming together, a child being conceived and brought into the world. So Nicodemus, that's the only mindset, the only thought process he has of being born. And so Jesus is explaining to him, this is a birth through the spirit, not of the flesh. Verse six says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse seven, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so again, the question that Nicodemus posed to Jesus, many of us, as I said from the outset, have that same question in our minds. How is it that we are born again? So we're going to take a little journey um, to examine the life of Jesus Christ and understand that even as he was uh, supernaturally placed into the womb of his mother, that he comes to live and dwell on the inside of the believer. So to begin our journey, we're going to look over in 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. And so again, we're laying a little foundation here so that you can understand um, that Jesus is the living word. Verse 7 of 1 John chapter 5 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, talking about God. The word in here, word is capitalized. Anytime you see word capitalized in the Bible, that is an indication and a reference to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So here in first John chapter five, we see the Trinity being identified three that bear re record in heaven, God, the father, Jesus, the son, also known as the word and the Holy Spirit. And it says these three are one. So basically that's what Trinity means, three in one. And so as we see, we want you to pay close attention to the fact that the word in reference to Jesus is capitalized. So anytime you see that in the Bible, we know that we are referencing Jesus Christ and we know that our salvation comes through him. Now let's turn over to St. John uh, chapter one, St. John chapter one. And we're going to see that the word is emphasized again. St. John chapter one. Let me get over there. Starting with verse number one, we're going to read verses one, two, and three. And it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So now as we examine that verse, it talks about the word again being capitalized just as we saw over in first John chapter five. And it says in the beginning was the word. Jesus is that word that is referencing here. And it says, and the word was with God. So Jesus did not just come into existence when Mary conceived and when he was born in a manger, it says in the beginning. So from the outset, the Godhead was complete. God, the father, Jesus, the son and the Holy Spirit. And so it says here that the word was with God and the word was God. Now, remember, we read over in first John five and seven, it says these three are one. And so therefore we can see that Jesus was there in the beginning with God. When God created the heavens and earth over in Genesis, when we have that account, we recognize that Jesus was there with him along with the Holy spirit. Verse two goes on to say he was in the beginning with God. Here you can see his involvement in creation in verse three, all things were made through him, through him, who through the word, who is the word? The word is Jesus Christ. And without him, nothing was made that was made. 
So again, we can see here um, that the word Jesus Christ is being identified. So we're laying the foundation here because we have to recognize that our salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is the living word. Now, if we drop down to verse 14, this talks about Jesus taking on the form of a man. Verse 14 says, and the word, again, you see word is capitalized, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so now we recognize that the word who is Jesus Christ was with God in the beginning. When the world was framed, when the world was created, Jesus was there along with the father and the Holy spirit. Now in this verse, verse 14, it says the word became flesh. And so that's what we're going to examine today, how Jesus took on the form of a man, how he indeed became flesh. But remember, he is the only begotten of the father. So there is no earthly man that is responsible for Jesus being here. Yes, Joseph was his stepfather. But if you read over in the book of Matthew, um, Joseph and Mary did not come together as husband and wife until after Jesus was born. So we're going to take a look over now in the book of Luke, the book of Luke chapter one. And here we're going to see how Jesus was conceived, not in the normal manner that we were conceived, but Jesus was born of the spirit. Now over in Luke chapter one, if you're turning over there with me, we're going to begin at verse number 26, Luke chapter one, verse number 26. And it says now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, if you read the prior verses, we won't take time to do that. Now you can see where John the Baptist, um, was conceived where he was born. Um, or should I say his birth was being announced to his father and his mother, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And so it's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. And at this same time, the angel Gabriel is paying a visit to Mary. And it says, reading verse 26 again. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So again, it wasn't that Gabriel decided to just go on his own. He was sent by God. He was a messenger from God to visit Mary. Verse 27, where did he go? To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And so in this, we can see that Mary and Joseph were engaged. And I can imagine um, just as, as a woman in the natural, uh, when you have been found by that special someone, that you're all excited um, about getting married, planning the wedding. Uh, what dress are you going to wear? Uh, reception, the ceremony, all of the intricacies of planning that grand event. So here she is engaged to Joseph, but they have not yet married. And it says um, that she was a virgin. Now, all of these terms that have been put in the word of God are vitally important. So we see here by her being a virgin, that means that she has not been sexually involved with any man. So she is pure. And so as we continue reading on in verse number 28, it says, and having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Now, again, um, as we continue reading, you will see that this is possibly not the first visitation that Mary has had with an angel, because it doesn't say as we continue reading that she was uh, disturbed by his presence, but it was by his conversation. All right. In verse number 28, reading that again, it says, and having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. So uh, Gabriel is giving honor to Mary and saying that she has found favor with God. 
Verse 29, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Now, again, as I said before, based on what is written here in verse 29, it didn't say she was troubled at his appearance. She was troubled at his presence. It says she was troubled at his saying. The greeting that he had brought to her at this point was not like any of the greeting that she had received. He said, highly favored one. So she's probably turning over in my mind. What do you mean, highly favored one? And then it goes on to say in verse number 30, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. So Gabriel is being very plain with her now, letting her know that she has caught the attention of God. And she has found favor with him and that God has a purpose and a plan for her life. And that plan is about to be revealed. Then he goes on to outline exactly what his mission is. Now, as we begin reading here, notice that Gabriel is bringing a word to Mary. He is bringing the word to Mary. In verse number 31, and it says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. So therefore, Gabriel is bringing to Mary the living word. He is telling her that she will bring forth a son, and that child's name is to be called Jesus. Now, he goes on to explain that this is no ordinary baby that you're about to um, have deposited in your womb. Verse 32 says, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. So as Gabriel lays out to Mary very clearly, the child that she is to carry, he lets her know that this is the savior of the world, that he will, of his reign, there will be no end. This is not just your ordinary uh, baby. <laughs> He's not going to just grow up to be a doctor. He's not just going to grow up to be a lawyer. He's not going to grow up to be an architect. Um, no ordinary uh, assignment. This is the savior of the world. Now, as we continue reading and Mary is receiving and listening to the message that Gabriel has brought to her, um, she is not of the cabbage patch persuasion. And you know, the, the old myth that babies are found under a cabbage leaf, absolutely not. Mary knew better than that. So as we continue reading in verse number 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. And so that's not saying that I don't know any men in the world. It's simply saying, I don't know a man in the manner in which children are conceived. So you're telling me that I'm going to have this child. His name is going to be Jesus. He's going to be the savior of the world. All of these things. But how can this be since I do not know a man? Now she's engaged, but she's still a virgin. Verse 35. And so Gabriel begins to explain to her how this process is going to take place. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And so again, Mary's thinking in the natural, I don't know a man in that way, so there's no way that I can bring forth this child that you're talking about. So Gabriel Brins begins to explain to her that the power of God, the Holy Spirit will come upon her and in that she will conceive. Now, it seems like um, the angel just uh, has a little schizophrenic break here, if you will. Because he was talking about how the child would be implanted in her womb. And now he starts talking about her cousin Elizabeth. 
Verse number 36. It says, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Now, this is a key point that the angel is making to Mary. Now, you say, how so? In order for Mary to fully grasp the power of God and what God is able to do, Gabriel uses a natural example in her cousin Elizabeth, who is now pregnant. She is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Now, again, if we look back at the end of verse 30, 36, it says it is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So again, Elizabeth had passed childbearing age. And so again, all through her life in the marriage of, of, of she and John the Baptist or, or Zacharias rather, um, they were not able to have children. And so again, because she's past the, the childbearing age, the angel is saying, take a look at your cousin. This is a natural circumstance that could not happen. Now, think about in your own family. If there are women in your family, uh, maybe an uncle, an aunt, someone, um, and you have even little children take notice of it, say, Mama, where is aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so's child? Then mom or dad begins to explain, well, uncle so-and-so and aunt so-and-so never were able to have children. So being barren is common knowledge. So everyone was aware that Zacharias and Elizabeth were not able to have children. But at this point, she is now six months pregnant. So what Gabriel is pointing out to Mary is a natural example so that she can see what the power of God is capable of doing. Then he goes on to say in verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And so if Mary can understand that God did that work in Elizabeth, that God caused her to be able to conceive in old age, even after being past childbearing age, that what God was telling her was going to take place in her life was but a light thing for him. Now, as we're continuing to read, remember that Gabriel is bringing the word to Mary. He is bringing a message to Mary. And so as she has heard his example and she's reflected on the, the fact that, yes, my cousin Elizabeth, my old cousin Elizabeth is six months pregnant. Then she comes to this conclusion, verse 38, and this is where Jesus was conceived. Then Mary said, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So again, when Mary came to that conclusion, be it unto me, according to thy word, let it be at just as you have said, conception took place. Now, if you read further on in that chapter, Mary then decides to go and pay a visit to Elizabeth. And so again, that final trimester of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Mary is there with her. If we jump down to verse 56 in that same chapter, it talks about her uh, visiting um, Elizabeth and how when she came in and greeted Elizabeth, that John the Baptist leaked in Elizabeth's womb. Because again, let's see what verse that is. Verse 43, it says, but why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. So Elizabeth is already aware that Mary is carrying the savior of the world. And so again, Mary's visit is extended for three months. Look at verse number 56. And it says, and Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her house. Now, you said, what is the comparison of, okay, Jesus has been conceived. He has been placed in the womb of Mary. Think about it. When the angel came to Mary, he did not come carrying a baby and say, this is, is who you're going to carry. He brought to her a word. And we have to recognize that word capitalized, Jesus is the living word. And so when she accepted his word, when she accepted his message, conception took place. The birth process began on the inside of Mary. 
Now, if you think about it in the natural, when a woman um, conceives uh, in that first instant, there is no indication outwardly that she's pregnant. And probably for the first three months, just depending on how she carries, people may see her and not even be aware that she is with child. And so again, that's in the natural. But as Mary received that word that was brought to her from the angel, Jesus Christ began to grow and develop on the inside of her. And as he continued to grow and to develop from the first trimester, moving into the second, by the time a woman gets to the fourth, the fifth, the sixth month, then it's obvious to all that she is with child, that she is carrying a little one on the inside of her. And that same condition is what happens when we are born again. Think about it. When you came forward and accepted the word of Jesus Christ and you said, Lord, um, I accept you as savior of my life. You didn't see anything happen, but you received the word. You received the living word. And when you said, Father, forgive me of my sins. Uh, I invite Jesus to be Lord of my life. Boom. Just like in Mary, conception took place. The new birth began. And as a babe in Christ, as we begin to, to feed on the word, to eat the word, to walk in the ways of God, maybe initially people can't tell that something is different about us. But as that baby, as that word of God, as Jesus begins to grow and develop on the inside of you, then it becomes evident to all that something is different about you. There's a new life in Christ that has been birthed in you. And so again, think about it in the natural, again, looking at this pregnant woman, when we are uh, come to the point of the third trimester, it is almost time for that child to be delivered. Sometimes at those points, you almost see the child before you see the mom, the belly is protruding. And some people, instead of looking at the mom in the face, what are they doing? They're looking at the belly. How far along are you? When is the baby due? Why? Because Christ has developed on the inside and is seeing more of him than you see of the mom. Now, the same thing takes place in the life of a Christian. As we decrease and Christ grows and develops on the inside of us, people begin to see less of us and more of him. Less of us and more of him. Let's take a look over in... Um, in Romans so that we can fully understand uh, that this is a faith walk and that if we can understand how Jesus was conceived, then we can understand how the new birth takes place in our lives. Now we know over in Romans 3 and 23, it tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So none of us in our own strength, in our own merit, in our own character can say that we, um, are fit to go to heaven. We're not. And so again, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but God loved us so much that he did not leave us in a state of sinfulness. So what did he do? God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That everlasting life comes only through Jesus Christ. Over in Romans 5, 19, it tells us through one man's obedience that many were made righteous. That one man's obedience was Jesus Christ. Because he dared to obey God, because he dared to take on the form of human flesh, because he dared to die on the cross, that gave us the opportunity to become in right standing with God and have eternal life promised to us. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And so again, we know that our salvation is not because of anything that we have done. It's only because of Christ. Romans 10. So if you're coming to the point now of, of saying, wow, you know, I want to be born again. I want um, to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Let's look over in Romans 10. Romans 10 chapter 8. Romans 10 chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 8 through eight through 10 and verse eight says, let me get over there. It says, 
but what does it say? The word is near you. What's near you? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. Remember the angel brought a word to Mary. When she said, be it unto me, she received the word conception took place. So again, the word of faith that Jesus Christ can save you, that Jesus Christ can deliver you, that you can be born again. It's near you. That is the word that we preach. Verse nine says that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So think about all those times that people have witnessed to you and they've offered Christ to you and they've invited you to accept him as your personal savior. Until the moment that you were willing to receive that taught word, receive that preached word, to accept that invitation, you were not born again. But the moment that you asked Jesus to come into your heart, boom, conception took place just as it did with Mary. When she said, be it unto me, according to your word, it says, if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, if you own him, you are born again. Verse number 10 says, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So you can't just think your way. You have to be willing to open your mouth and accept what Jesus Christ has done. You invite him to be Lord of your life. That he begins to take preeminence. That people begin to see less of you and more of him living and dwelling on the inside of you. So I invite you today, if you have not accepted Jesus as your personal savior, now is a great time to do it. If you can understand how Jesus Christ was conceived, that he was born of the spirit, then you can also see that your new birth is of the spirit. Even as Nicodemus asked in the beginning, can I go a second time into my mother's womb? Absolutely not. Because whatever is born of flesh is flesh. But this is talking about a spiritual birth. Ephesians 2 as we close out today, and hopefully you've understood our comparison. Let's look at Ephesians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And it says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Verse nine goes on to say, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So I'm inviting you to accept the greatest gift of all. God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And so he's given to us his only begotten son, the gift of eternal life that only is given to us through him. We receive it by receiving his son. It says, it is the gift of God. Your salvation is the gift of God. It's not of works. It's not of anything that you have done. It's only by believing and confessing. As it says in Romans 10, believe and confess and you have become born again. So hopefully we've answered the question for you, um, even as Nicodemus posed to Jesus, how does one become born again? And Jesus adamantly said to him, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, I'm encouraging you today, take the gift, accept the free gift, receive the gift free to you because you didn't have to pay anything, but it cost Christ his life. We celebrate his birth during this season of the year. So as we close out 2021, make sure that you're in the family of God, that you have experienced this birth of the spirit. God bless you and Merry Christmas. You guys have a great 
uh, rest of your day. Pastor Anderson will be on um, to share a word from the Lord. And as we're closing out 2021, remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. God bless you all. Thank you so much for listening to Dr. Anderson as she shared with you the importance of being born again and understanding the nature of Jesus coming, the purpose of Jesus coming, and receiving him. This is what Christmas is all about, and we ought to be excited about it. We ought to be excited because Jesus is the reason for the season. Now I'm going to invite you over to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 11, and what I'm going to share with you quickly is wise worship at Christmas. So I want you to say that to yourself, wise worship at Christmas. What do I mean by that? What is the reason for the season? And then we have gotten off track with all the Santa Claus, the Rudolph Red Nose Reindeer and all those other things. And I see so many believers. I'm talking to Christians now. My assignment is perfecting saints to walk in covenant relationship with God. And I see so many of us and we don't see the harm of participating or displaying uh, sitting on Santa Claus lap, reindeers and all those things. Now, you're not going to miss heaven over it, hopefully, and hopefully you've made a personal decision about Jesus Christ. But when we read the scripture, we must be accurate with the scripture. We get confused, the manger and the house. What do I mean? Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem, and then the wise men came to the house. So the shepherds uh, are at the manger, and glorifying God, the wise men are at the house two years later. So this is vitally important. You say, why? The Bible teaches us to abstain from the very appearances of evil. And if we continue to indulge ourselves just in the tradition of uh, national Christmas or holiday without Christ or Xmas without Christ, then we miss the true purpose and nature of Christmas. So I'm going to indulge in scripture. I'm going to uh, open your eyes. Hopefully you can see differently some things that God talks about, wise worship. So in other words, Christmas brings on worship. It brings on joy. It brings on celebration because we know Jesus, because we receive Jesus, because we have eternal life. We're excited. So anytime we go back and read or uh, look at uh, the scriptures concerning Christmas, uh, we should be accurate with it so our joy can be full. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Notice we're talking about uh, wise worship. How should we celebrate and how should we worship? Is Jesus included in your Christmas? Is he the reason for the season? Matthew 2, 1 says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Did you catch that? After Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So this story is told two years after, or the time of it happening, two years after Bethlehem. The scripture is very clear, but I think a lot of times we gloss over scriptures only to do our own thing. That's in every area of our lives. So a lot of people have gotten twisted with me, upset because of the truth. But you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. So it tells you right here clearly in the scripture, Matthew 2, 1, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So this whole incident takes place after Jesus was born. Uh, and men came from the east, wise men. Uh, it said, didn't say king. Uh, Herod was the king, but the wise men came from the east and came to Jerusalem. Now, Bethlehem is five miles outside the city of Jerusalem. I was fortunate, I say this often, to visit the place and to visit Bethlehem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't say it to be braggadocious, but when you put your eyes, your hand, your feet in a place, you can better understand and comprehend the biblical story by going back and looking at the Ancient of Days. The second verse said, so the wise men came and they sang, where is he who was born, who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Come and worship him. This, this is their purpose for traveling for two years to meet Jesus 
and to see Jesus, but to worship him. These was astrologers, uh, wise men, whatever. Uh, they studied the times and signs and all of these things, uh, diviners, as they would call them in the scripture, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But they searched scientifically, not just spiritually, but the stars, they studied them. And the stars appeared at this time, and that star began to lead them uh, to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem. And so it tells you now after his birth, uh, they came to what? Worship. How many of you today come to worship? How many of you uh, made up your mind to worship? How many of you on this last Sunday of the year said, I come to worship Jesus. I'm here to worship Jesus. I'm celebrating Christmas because of Jesus. Or are you still stuck on Santa Claus lap? or Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And, and some people get to us, you're messing up my children. Let me turn it off, uh, Christmas. Why not tell them the truth? I've never uh, exposed my children or shared with them, and they are grown. I mean, over 30 and over 20. Uh, and so I've never, even grandchildren, we have not taught them about Santa Claus. They see it, they know of it, they're in the world, they understand the philosophy of the world, traditions of the world, but the reason of the season is Jesus. So after he was born, let's look at the next point, uh, where Christ was born, where Jesus is born. Verse 3, Matthew chapter 2, it says this, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. So when Herod heard about the time and he's now late and this is the third or second Herod is not the first. They were constantly named and then Herod King Agrippa. Uh, was one, but this Herod, the time of Jesus. So how do we know the time? How can we research the time? Because it's given away in the scripture. It tells you what king, if you look up which Herod this was, uh, what his name was, and uh, you can research the time. And so history alone can tell you the time that he ruled. And so Herod the king heard this and he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him, the meaning the uh, Jews, Israelites. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was born or to be born. So in other words, Herod wanted to know what does the scripture say? So this is how we can pinpoint the time. He invited all of his religious folk, chief priests, and scribes, secretaries to them, and secretaries to the temple and the tabernacle, and they kept notes. So he said to them, what does the scripture say? He inquired of them, where is Christ to be born? Verse 5 says, so they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So they are identifying Jesus' time, birth, all that this scripture is to open your eyes and it differs from the book of Luke uh, that tells you about the announcement from the angels, uh, how they celebrated, how Mary received it and how Joseph was then inspired by the angel and informed by the angel and the shepherds came to the manger. These are the wise men coming later if you open your eyes to the scripture. So they say it's written in the scripture, it's in Bethlehem. Now, what time did you see the star? That's what the king wanted to know. So when is the time? Where is the place? What is the time? Verse six says, but you Bethlehem, he's quoting scripture, but you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are not the least among the rulers of Judah? For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. You'll find that in Micah chapter five, verse two. And so all they're doing is repeating scripture. He asked the chief priests, he asked the scribes. And you would think, as Dr. Anderson has shared about Jesus uh, being the son of God, you would think after all the scriptures the people know, they would willingly accept. But do you know it's a lot of people today still know the scripture, read the scripture, understand the scriptures, but we rather replace Jesus with a fictionist uh, Santa Claus. We rather place Jesus with flying reindeer. We rather place Jesus or replace Jesus with elf and making toys in the North Pole. Now, some people say, well, I'm not going to miss heaven over that. And you probably won't, hopefully, if you know Jesus. Now, if you don't know Jesus, you will miss heaven. But why not tell the truth? Why not put Jesus up front? Why not let them know this is the reason? Imagine if the whole church would make noise about Jesus, if the whole church would worship Jesus, if the whole church would glorify him and not allow the other things to become the forefront. And so verse seven says, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men. So where did we get three kings in a manger? So we're mixing our scriptures up. 
the shepherd came to the manger at the time of the birth. The wise men came uh, two years later. He said he called them secretly the wise men, and it didn't say three either, uh, determined from them what time the star appeared. What did he want to know? From them, what time did the star appear? When did you see this star? So in other words, he was identifying. They were astrologers. As I said, they were uh, uh, men that studied science. And so they were considered wise men, not kings. And so I'm talking about wise worship because it's wise for us to understand the purpose of worship and to worship Jesus. And so he said, what time did the star appear? And he uh, sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully. Go and search. Notice this because he noticed the time. Go search carefully for the young child. Notice he didn't say baby in the manger because this is two years later, go search for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. You know, Herod didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. He wanted to uh, stop Jesus from replacing him because the story was he was king of the Jews. Jesus was to be king of king and Lord of Lord. And so Herod still said, if you worship, I want to worship. How many know if we would elevate Jesus during this season, if we would have a wise worship about Christmas, then others would say true or false, real or not, I want to worship him too. If we say, come, let us adore him, others will want to adore him and praise him. But the church has become silent and we just buy into the same story. Well, there's nothing wrong. This preacher is too serious. You know what? I am a teacher of the gospel. Gospel. Not only a preacher, I have the ability to do both, but I, I believe in studying the scripture and putting things line by line and precept by precept. Paul says in Galatians chapter one, the revelation I have of Jesus didn't come from flesh and blood, but he revealed himself to me. So because I have a personal relationship, personal revelation, my desire is always to inspire, to teach and instruct you with the scripture. And even if I have to correct or rebuke, the scripture were written for all of those things. Amen. And so uh, it said in Bethlehem, I want to come and worship him. And when they heard the king, they departed and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till they, it came and stood over where the young child was. I wish we would get our scriptures right. It didn't come over the manger. It came where the young child was. The scripture is very clear and very plain. And a lot of you say, well, Christians contradict the scriptures. Their worship is false and they have the trees and all of these different things. And so sinners or unbelievers are trying to put the church in condemnation. And the church will not open its eyes so that the glorious light of the gospel could shine in. I'm telling you, the scripture says this was a young child uh, at the time the wise men found him. Are you following me? The shepherds, Luke, came to the manger. The wise men came to the house. Look at verse 10, and it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced. See, still praising, still worship. They rejoiced with exceeding great joy because now they have been led to what they had scientifically studied out of the book of Daniels and being in the East. These men coming from that area, uh, they had studied Daniel's writing that there will be born in Bethlehem. They had studied Micah's writing that it will be in Bethlehem. They had studied the scriptures just like the scribes kept notes. So there, you know, there was notes. There were books written. There were things that they could study and research. And for two years, they looked for Jesus. How, many, how long have you looked for Jesus? How long will you look for Jesus? And how long will you look for the truth? Praise God. And it says here, when they came, verse uh, 11, when they came to the house, praise the Lord. And when they had come into the house, I mean, if we would just read the scripture, the scripture is plain. God's word is a lamp before our feet and a light before our path. But the church has accepted only tradition. You know, I was in a class a few weeks ago, a real estate class, and, and our instructor was saying, how long is people going to keep doing things wrong when the law says this? And he said, we just won't change. Or we're saying that we ought to do it this way when the law says it this way. And he began to uh, tell us that people rather be wrong than right. That's our human nature. If you look from Adam to now. And so the scripture is very plain when they had come into the house. It didn't say a manger. 
And I don't care what version you read it, these wise men, two years later, found Jesus in the house, and they came, glory to God, to worship him. And so when they came to the house, they saw the young child. Come on, what did it say? They saw, look, the young child with Mary, his mother. Now, there is no Joseph there. So obviously, when they got to the house and approached the house, Joseph was not around, out working. Are you following me? And so they found Mary and the young child. It doesn't say Joseph. You go back over to Luke, uh, then in Luke chapter 2, I believe I said one earlier, verses 8 through 20, uh, they came into the manger, the shepherds did, and they saw Joseph, Mary, and the baby lying in the manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. So Jesus was born of a virgin woman. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, Jesus was born of a virgin woman to redeem us from the law. Somebody ought to get excited about it. Believers ought to get excited. If nothing's under the tree, if there was no dinner on the table or special turkey, I ate something, I'm alive a day after the national celebration of Christmas, and I'm still excited about Jesus. Regards to who lost, who's not lost, who's at the table with me, who's not at the table. It's all about Jesus. The joy of Christmas is because you know Jesus. Worship him now. So he said he, uh, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 2, where am I? Verse 11. Uh, they saw the young child with his mother and fell down and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts for him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. How many know worship is all about giving? If you're going to worship Jesus, how many of you have given Jesus a gift this Sunday? How many of you are giving in your tithes and offering? Chapter 7 of Hebrew says, Jesus, he who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, receive your tithe. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, he called them hypocrites because they tithe with mint, coming, anus, but they didn't uh, obey or receive the weightier matters, which is faith, uh, judgment, and mercy. And he said, do these things and don't leave the other undone. Don't leave tithing undone. So how many of you have celebrated this day with Jesus? How many of you are prepared to worship him with your giving? Or have you spent it all? Have you, have you gotten in debt to exchange gifts? And our exchange of gifts for the joy of this day Praise the Lord for giving and giving toys and preparing uh, meals for those who are less fortunate or, or giving out baskets. Praise God is all about expressing Jesus and giving them the joy of Jesus. Are you following me? And so when they opened their treasures, gold, because he was a king, gold, because God will meet our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus, gold, God walks on it in heaven, the streets are paid with it. So Joseph and Mary uh, would not have any need that need to be met. So they had gold, plenty of gold, are you following me, to take care of their expenses. So when God said go to Egypt, they didn't have to catch a ride, bum a ride, or fast and pray until they got enough money. They gave them gold, they gave them frankincense, which recognized his priesthood. Jesus is our high priest, Hebrews chapter 4. And they gave him myrrh, which represents the tree that he would be crucified on and the fragrance in which they would come and anoint his body. So as I bring this lesson to a close about wise worship at Christmas time, hopefully this scripture illustration has helped you. I want you to know that worship belongs to deity. Worship belongs to who? Deity. So let's go over quickly to the book of uh, Luke, and I'll give you that story, verse 8, and I'll skip through some of those verses through verse 20. So Luke uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 8 uh, let's start there. It says, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Now, how can we pinpoint Jesus' birth? Not only where he was, but when he was, because there's a certain time, a year and season, that shepherds would be in the field. During the winter, they wouldn't be in the field. Matter of fact, Jesus even said in his teaching after he's here, be careful that your flight or, or your time of departure is not in the winter because Jews, Israelites, didn't travel or do anything in the winter. So when he warned about his return, make sure it's not in the winter. So they were feeding their flocks at night, and behold, uh, behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, 
and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, but behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So the, uh, the uh, announcement of Jesus coming. For there is born to you, listen to me, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Where is he born? He's born this day. So the wise men come in Matthews. Uh, two years later, the shepherds come this day. So while they were in the field, the announcement is made. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe, not a young child, but a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with uh, the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards all men. So look at the praise. At his birth, at the announcement, they go and find him in the manger. That's where you ought to have, and that's who you ought to have uh, outside your nativity scene or your manger would be the shepherds. But when the wise men come, and if you're calling them kings, they ought to be at the house. So we want to have wise worship, glory to God, at Christmas time. And so the angels began to praise, the angel began to worship, the angels, they found Mary and Joseph, and verse 20 says, then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told to them. So God was identifying the day, the time of Jesus' birth with the shepherds. They went and saw the angels praise, the shepherds praise, and let me tell you, you and I are to praise. Let's go over to Revelation quickly as I end in chapter 19, verse 9 and verse 10. What did I say to you? Wise worship at Christmas. And I said, worship belongs to a deity. What will I show you in Revelation as we end? In Revelations 19 and Revelations 22, uh, the angel was speaking to John to write. And when John was hearing these magnificent things and awesome things, he went to bow down to worship the angel. And the angel says, stop, I'm just a servant just like you. So we worship no one. We don't worship Santa Claus. We don't worship reindeer. We don't worship elves. We don't worship all these things. We puffed up in our imagination. Worship belonged to God. Worship belonged to Jesus Christ and praise belonged to him. Revelations chapter 19, verse nine. Then he said, this is the angel speaking. He said to me, right, blessed are those, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the lamb, to the merit supper of who? The lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at my feet, at his feet. He said, I fell at his feet to worship him, the angel. I'm hearing this awesome announcement. And he began to worship the angel. You shouldn't worship any man. You shouldn't put any man before God. You, uh, Paul said it, Barnabas, when people fell at their feet, men should stop looking for praise and worship. If you're in a ministry, a cult, or anything where you are worshiping the man greater than God, greater than Christ, then you are in the wrong place. I say, arise, those of you that are asleep, and Christ will give you light. The worship and the praise belong to him. So this angel tells uh, John, uh, he said, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. Don't do that. He says, why? As he tell him, I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have testimony of Jesus. Worship God, worship God, exclamation mark, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the prophecy. So you obviously this is another person. Angels are servants. They're here to serve us. We got a song, angels can't sing. We've been redeemed. Angels never been redeemed. And so therefore angels don't expect worship. Fallen angels have gotten out of their natural state and came and married women and men. And so angels are not to be worshiped. No other deity, only God, only Jesus Christ. And we got to be wise during our worship time. One more revelation of that. And the revelation has given us revelation. Chapter 22, verse 8 and 9, you'll see the same thing. The angel speaks. John wants to worship and he says, stop it. Now I, John, saw and heard these things. Now the, the, the shepherds saw and heard, and they glorified God for seeing Jesus. The wise men came to the house when he was two years old, and they wanted to worship Jesus, not Joseph, not Mary, for those of you that are worshiping Mary. They wanted to worship Jesus. He's been born and come in the flesh. 
Now I saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angels who showed me these things. This is John said, I, John, fell down to worship these angels. I'm telling you, worship belonged to God. Praise belonged to God. Oh, come, let us adore him. Verse 9 says, then he said to me, the angels corrected him, men, people, those of you that's in certain position and posture or platforms, you better make sure you're warning people, stop it. I don't care what your position, how much you think you're a prophet or whatever you are, you better warn the people, stop it. You got to get out of that light, out of that platform. Some people that's not even in Christ trying to condemn the church, condemn a tree, condemn, condemn wrapping paper and all this other stuff. You better get out of that platform and get off that platform and pedestal. If you are allowing men to worship you, you need to tell them, stop it. The angel spoke up. I'm telling you, worship belong to God. Come, let us adore him and praise him. Then he said to me, see that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant. Angels are to serve us, administer to us. I release angels on my behalf to go find the finances, go find the things to bring and usher the things that God has promised to me. They are servants. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14, I command them, I release angels. He says, see that you do not do that for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and it said of those who keep the words of this book. He says to them, worship God. I say to you, I don't care if you're a prophet, angel, whatever you are, we're here to worship God. How many are joining me to worship God? How many come to praise him and to give him the glory that is due to his name? So we talked about today what? Wise worship. Dr. Anderson has shared with you about understanding who Jesus is and being born again and knowing Christ. He's part of that trinity. He came in the flesh. And I'm telling you that we come to worship him. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for sharing your Christmas Sunday with us, the last Sunday of the year. And the 31st of December, we are going to eulogize uh, this year of 2021. We came out of it. Praise God. Those of you still here listening to me, praise God. Uh, coronavirus, COVID didn't take you out. Nothing else took you out. And so God has ordained your time and delay does not mean denial. Jesus is coming back. He'll keep that which we committed unto him until that day. So New Year's Eve night, I will be ministering from the studio. Wednesday coming, the 29th, I believe it is, we will have messages played uh, concerning divine delay. You need to go back and review this uh, unless you allow these things to slip. And then be prepared. Dr. Anderson and I will be coming via um, Zoom. So you get the number, it'll be on the screen. Uh, you got to uh, dial into that. We'll be in the studio via Zoom. For those of you who want to privately address us, say hello so that we can have uh, interaction with each other. So I thank you so much for sharing today. I'm going to enjoy vacation, take a break, so you will have uh, videos play on Wednesday. Be there at 7 that You need these messages about divine delay. I pulled the archive out when I was a little thicker and chubby and uh, looked like I had swallowed a couple turkeys. But thank God for the word, praise God. Today I got my Christmas outfit on, hallelujah. Praise God, looked like Christmas all the way. So I'm excited about this year. I'm excited about what has taken place, place and transpired. And I'm excited about going into the next year. And if it's the Lord's will and God say so, praise God, I'll be back with you. And uh, we will usher in that new year on December 31. Thank you so much for enjoying this last Sunday of the year, 52 Sundays. You ought to lift your hands and praise God, he has kept us. And nothing has been able to defeat us. And we believe that God is able to keep that which we committed unto him. I love you so much. Thank you for sharing. And I look forward to being back with you in the studio, December 31. So I'm gonna take a pause and pray with you concerning offering. Those of you that's giving in your tithes and offering, we're not physically together, and some of you are giving on a regular basis. So let's do that as we dismiss. Father, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity of giving. We thank you, first of all, for your word. We thank you that worship is giving. And so we give to you. We praise you. We honor you. Jesus, today is your birthday. Today, the nations celebrate. 
your birthday. However, we know uh, what time it says in the scripture that you were born. It wasn't December 25th, but we praise you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. We praise you from January through December and going into the next year. So today we give of our tithes and offerings. We obedient. You said return to you as you return to us. How have we left you in tithes and offerings? And you said if we give our tithes and bring our tithes, that you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to receive. You love a cheerful giver, able to make all grace abound, that we have sufficiency of all things. We thank you for it. You give a seed to sow and then you multiply it. You increase the fruits of our righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Wealth and riches are in our house, Psalms 112. You increase us more and more, Psalms 115. You are our shepherd and we shall not want. You make us to lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still waters. You restore our souls. You prepare tables before us in the presence of our enemies. Praise you, Father. Thank you that we've had enemies to watch us eat all year long. You fix the meal before us and we give you praise. Thank you, God, as we go out of this last Sunday. Prayerfully throughout the year, we have brought our tithes. Throughout the year, we have worship. And today, we worship you in giving. We thank you for those who've sown into this ministry. I speak specially for them and to them. The blessings of the Lord be upon you. May your face shine upon them continuously and give them light. We give you praise. We give him glory. And we thank you so much. God bless you. Enjoy this Christmas season and get ready for the new year. God bless you. I love you. I want to share with you how to become a born-again believer into the Christian family. The word Christian is only in the Bible three times. Jesus' original intent was for us to become believers, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Number one, recognize that you are a sinner and hopelessly lost without Christ. Romans 8, chapter 3, verse 12 and verse 23. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us need him. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. John 3 tells us in verse 5 through 7 and verse 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The second thing you need to do to become a believing, born-again Christian Believe the good news that God sent Jesus Christ to take your place, died in your stead, and paid the full penalty for sin. He was raised from the dead. So we need to believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that Jesus has come in our place in Romans 5 and 8, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 17. Make sure that you read these scriptures. The third thing you need to do to become a believing Christian, born again Christian, began to confess this with your mouth and believe in your heart that God through Christ can save you. Romans 10, it tells us that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, then we shall be saved. Whoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You also see that reference in John 3, and we gave you that verse earlier. Hebrews 7.25, we know that the Lord saved us to the utmost, and today is the time for us to call upon His name. The fourth thing you need to do to become a born-again believing Christian is rely on God's Word and not your own feelings or theories. Not feeling that we save is nothing that we have done, is all that He has done. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, all the promises of God is yes and amen. Rely upon God's promises. The fifth thing, realize that you are saved by grace through faith in Christ, not anything you have done. You'll find that quoted in Ephesians and written in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and nine for we are saved by grace through faith not of ourselves lest any man should boast also in first john 1 and 9 tells us for those of you that's even coming back to the lord if you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you from your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and so if you've done those things 
and you decided today that you want to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, and even those that need to recommit your life back to Him and you strayed away, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word declares that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I confess my belief in Jesus, and I know that you gave and given unto me salvation. You said in your word, if I shall confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I will be saved. I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe he lived, died, and was raised from the dead for my justification and my salvation. I'm calling upon the name of Jesus. So I know, Father, that you save me now. Your word says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I do believe with my heart, and I confess Jesus now as my Savior. Therefore, I am saved. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. If you have done those things today, accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Do not rely on your feelings, rely on the Word of God. For those of you that are in a backslidden predicament, and today you're saying, I give my life back to you, Lord. The Bible says in 1 John, it says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jeremiah 3 says that God is married to the backslider, so he never divorced you. So don't divorce him. And so he will always receive you back. Hebrews tells us your sins and iniquities he will not remember anymore. So say this with me. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your forgiveness. I believe now that I am forgiven. I come back to you humbly. I repent of my sins. I am sorry. And God, I thank you that you receive me in love. You receive me by grace, and I receive restoration in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast. We air our broadcast Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. and Sundays at 11 o'clock a.m. on Facebook, YouTube, and Covenant Online. Join us every Saturday morning at 11.30 Eastern on the NOW Network. Whether you're at home or on your mobile device, you never have to be away from Covenant. Download our app and stay updated with events, messages, and pertinent information concerning the ministry through the CCM app. Watch your favorite sermon series and add the Covenant Christian Ministries channel app to your television through Roku or Amazon Prime Video. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at CCM Marietta. Also, visit our website, covenantchristianministries.org. Join us online every week for a word from God through Pastor Anderson. Be sure to comment and let us know that you're watching. There are four easy ways to give to Covenant Christian Ministries. You can give online at covenantchristianministries.org. You can also give using the CCM mobile app. If you have a PayPal account, you can give directly from the PayPal app using the friend and family option. You can also go to paypal.me forward slash covenantchristianmen. Lastly, you can always give by mail at P.O. Box 40. 65 Marietta, Georgia 30061. Your support makes ministry happen. Thank you again for joining us. Have a great week.